Uh, in the last couple of men's business meetings, we've, we've talked about where are we going from here? What are we doing? What direction do we want to take? And, um, we need some ideas. Uh, it's, it's one of those that uh, the congregation is full of very knowledgeable people and, you know, we, we need your input. Um, so, in a small way, maybe this will give us some ideas. Uh, feel free to tell any more or add in what you want or any questions that you want to to that. But uh, hopefully it's a, a little bit to help us spark our minds, help us to, to start thinking about where we want to go and what we want to do. In Acts chapter 2, uh, we come to the kind of the birthday of the church. There at Pentecost. Uh, appreciate Brody's reading. We're going to start in the first part of chapter 2. I'll read the first uh, 14 verses there. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Who are these that they're saying all in one accord? That's the apostles. Also, some of the disciples are there. So, we've got uh, everybody but Judas, and then his replacement, so that would be Matthias. There in one place with all the disciples. And suddenly there came a noise, uh, excuse me, a sound from heaven, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared divided tongues as of, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who are speaking Galatians? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, and we hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they are all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this be? Others, mocking, said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. And he continues with his lesson there. To give you a little context, this is the days of Pentecost, so it's a feast day. So, kind of like Rush Springs when we have Watermelon Day, you know, Watermelon Festival, we have our population, and then we have the huge inflation of, of people. I don't know what the, the last count was, but before we've had anywhere from four to 5,000 visitors total for that thing. Uh, we're around 1,500 to 1,800 sometimes. Uh, depending on a really good year, we, we have triple, double, triple, our, our normal population coming into the town. So during Pentecost, we've got Jews, as I had a list here from, from all kinds of places. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people dwelling from Mesopotamia, so we're, we're talking far flung. Also people from Rome, uh, Jews and proselytes. In uh, verse 5, it speaks about these men. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So not only do we have people from other places, but we have people from other places that have been dwelling in Jerusalem for a little while. Um, but they're, they're called devout men. So these are ones that are not, um, not knowledgeable of the scripture. They, they have um, more than likely been to synagogue, been to temple, and have been steeped in the word. Some of them may have a great knowledge of scripture. So these are not not knowledgeable men that are being uh, presented with what has happened in Jerusalem. Um, Peter goes on to present uh, what happened, you know, who this was that died, you know, why, why all of this happened, and that it was not just an accident, not just something that happened, but that it was a plan, that God has had this plan from the beginning of time that the church would be formed and the only way it's formed in Christ's blood. So it was not just by their, you know, their uh, intent of evil, 
but that this plan had to be fulfilled. Drop down to 36. This is the end of the lesson there. 36 through 40, just like Brody read. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Um, so the population of uh, Jerusalem, we have some widely varied accounts. We have a, a, a man who has kind of a, a biased interpretation that uh, he, he's got an agenda. He states that the, the population of Jerusalem, the stable population of Jerusalem at the time, was about 20,000. So if we had 20,000, we got, um, in the next verse it says 3,000 souls saved. That's a huge part of the population. And, you know, could easily grow quickly into the entire population being, being converted to Christianity. But the archaeological evidence shows us that it's about... Uh, anywhere from 80 to 100,000 stable on a feast day on this time of the year when Pentecost is happening, we could have anywhere from 160 to 180,000 people in town. Uh, so the population could be normally around 80 to 100,000, but you know could double, could easily double during the feast days, and that's the situation that we have a little after this. Uh, verse 41 and following. Then those who gladly, gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And then all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So 3,000. We've got, what, maybe 60, 50 something here tonight? Do you think just maybe 200? We're going to pack the place pretty good. Okay, maybe go to 400. We're not even at 1,000 yet. How do they get to one place at one time? The temple's the only area that they can all really be together are open areas, you know, outside the city. 3,000 people, that's, that's hard for our mind to grasp, and they grow daily. Later, uh, we get an account of, of 5,000. 5,000. It's almost a double of that. 3,000 people. Now these are, you know, as, as we find that their needs are being taken care of by those that are, have dwelt in Jerusalem. Uh, mentions Barnabas later in, uh, I think it's uh, oh, later in 8. But anyways, Barnabas sells a piece of property that uh, just to supply the needs of some of those that are, you know, they're needing food, the daily needs. And so they're continuing daily, daily. This, this is not something that the need goes down. Well, so they're sharing their property, they're sharing their goods, they're sharing their, their food, but they're also continuing in the apostles' doctrine and in prayer. What are they doing? I mean, they're, they're, what do they talk about? What what questions are they asking? Because some of them, Pentecost is the first time they've heard about this. I mean, they come and they've, they've heard, yeah, Jesus died, but we didn't hear anything about it. And then Peter says, we helped kill him. Well, yeah, okay. And so they're learning what happened. The apostles are teaching them not only, you know, what happened at the time, but what Jesus had been teaching them for three years. Parables and all these things that it's kind of like, that's what he was talking about. Oh, okay. I really get that now. 
And this is what he meant. And those that have been with them for a long time are also teaching this. And so the word is spreading and spreading and spreading. That knowledge base is growing. They have a large amount of spirit. They're ready to go. I mean, it's they're, they're on fire. But they don't have a lot of knowledge of you know, what happened, who, who Jesus is, how these connections are being made. And some of them, the devout men that we, we read about in verse, seven, uh, verse 5 there, are most likely making connections. Oh, this is the Messiah that was talked about. You know, we thought he was a criminal, but now we go, okay, he's not a criminal, he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, and we help kill him. Wow. And then a lot of things come together. They're like, okay. So the knowledge base is growing. But they're kind of in a waiting place. They're kind of, they're still at Jerusalem. So there's just that population that they're coming in contact with. They're, they're in a state of kind of static. It's small. It's, you know, 3,000 people. That's huge. But if you think about 3,000 people in possibly 160,000, it's not a lot of people, but it grows, slowly but surely. We're kind of in a waiting place. We're kind of, you know, well, okay, what do we do now? Well, they had a push. Uh, chapter 8, go over to chapter 8 there. Uh, it's ironic that later uh, Saul, who starts this push, Becomes a victim of it. All right. Chapter 8. Um, first word of verse, four verses there. Now Saul con was consenting to his death. This is talking about Stephen from the previous verses. Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered, all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So, this waiting was upset. Their peace, their, their unity was pushed out. They were, they were basically kind of exploded from where they were at in Jerusalem out to everywhere. All of the people that had come from other areas most likely went back home or went to an area that, you know, they knew they could go safely. But when they did, that's when real growth started because these little pieces of the church started growing others. Uh, my wife has some, some plants called succulents, and uh, that's her new, new passion in growing. But... Uh, they, if you break off a leaf, and if you're careful with them, it grows into an entirely new plant. So, it, you know, and it's funny, you put it in soil, it'll rot. You put it in water, it'll rot. But if you leave it alone, let it kind of dry up on the end and start putting out little root hairs. And once you've got enough of those, you can plant that, and it produces an entire new plant. It's kind of this way that these little fragments, these little pieces that are being pushed out by Saul in this persecution, become new churches. And that's later where Paul, you know, when he's on his missionary journeys and stuff, he runs into these congregations. Where did they get started from? They were started from this persecution. Well, let's not wait for, you know, something to push us out of a, of a, a peaceful unity. Let's seek the opportunities. Let's, let's look about our life and see daily what things we can go, you know, thinking about the conversation we're having and how can I turn what we're talking about toward a more spiritual matter. If it's on our mind continually, we'll find the opportunities. We'll think, hmm, okay, well, we're talking about, say, you know, work this weekend. Well, hey, you know, they say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something Saturday. And, and well, what are you going to do this week? Well, Sunday, you know, we always, we, we go to services, you know, and, uh, you know, we worship go over there. And it, it'll, it'll, It'll be a little of a shock in the conversation, but, you know, how else do you, do you break that ice of starting, you know, a spiritual matter with someone? you got to take an opportunity. Uh, at work, we have one of the a funny little posts.
posters. We have posters all over the place. That some of them have uh, um, very important messages, how to be safe at work. And uh, since we work in the food industry, they have one that says, uh, how many lives will you touch today? And it's, it shows this guy that doesn't watch his hands, and he's going through the job, and it's like it leaves his little fingerprints everywhere. If you think about yeah, somebody that didn't, and we're making ice cream for uh, one of the lines ran over 6,000 units uh, one afternoon. So 6,000, you know, three pint things. Well, how many people ate out of that? And if, if they weren't careful with that, how would how many people would they touch? Well, in our lives as Christians, how many people do we touch through what we do in the day? Do you, you know, when you're talking to the checker at, at the grocery store, you, you know, do you make, take that time to, to really talk with them? Do we take the time to say, hey, how's the weather? Or, or do we say, hey, you know, you look like you need some help or something. You know, you look a little sad, you know. Kind of touch that line. It, it may not be that moment that you get to talk to them about something biblical, but by continually making a contact with that person, you know, you, there's an opportunity that will arise, and it's there for you. Um, okay, go over to 276. Psalm number 276. Always enjoy this song. Um, first verse says, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, or plant my feet on higher ground. So, are we going to wait? Are we sitting still? Are we, <coughs> Did, are we pausing to rest? Or are we just going, that's high enough. I've done enough. It's, it's, you know, it really looks high. I don't know about that. But if we think about it, we know where we want to get. We know where we are. How do we get there? How do we get there? We continue, continually through our day, through every day that we live, persevere, struggle on. Um, higher ground. The higher you get, the more you see. The higher you get, the more you get closer to your goal. Um, our goal is heaven, so that's a long ways. Now, that doesn't mean that our work and our struggle is what gets us there, but we're a servants. If servants don't serve, then what good are we? I mean, as the salt of, you know, that he talks about in the scripture, if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it to be trampled in the road? So let's take our opportunities and grow, gain height in what we're doing, and keep our mind focused on that, that peak, that goal that we're going toward. If you're climbing a mountain, a lot of times you focus right on the trail, because sometimes it's hard to plant your feet there. Sometimes you get to look a little higher, and you get to see, oh, I see where the trail's going. And sometimes it's pretty daunting, because you're like, oh, boy, that's kind of a steep section. I'm really going to have to... But the more you plot, the more you plan the next few steps, I'm going there, I'm going here, I'm going here. You get higher and higher each time. So let's, let's take the opportunity, not only personally, but as a congregation, to grow, to gain, to go higher in what we're doing, to encourage one another on. Because, you know, we're in this together. This is, this is our job as a church, to encourage and edify one another on toward heaven. Um, go to Acts chapter 4. This will be our portion of that. Acts chapter 4, verses 24 through 31. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the, the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel, 
were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that, with all boldness, they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they, they spoke the word of God with boldness. Let's do that. It's hard. It's, it's not easy to get out of our little comfort zone. Yeah, you know, weather, 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 weather. Take the chance to go, hmm, let's talk Christ. So, if you have a need tonight, if you're a Christian who has a need, prayers of the church are, need to be returned to uh, working membership. If you're a person that has not put Christ on and not become a Christian, whatever need you have, please come and schedule us. I have my own invite.